He is risen. He is risen <laughs> Easter in November. Uh, that's fun. That's the last time I'll do that. But no, it's not. I'm going to do it again. We, I'm not going to be able to help it. Uh, but today, actually, I want to start, instead of jumping right into the resurrection, I want to talk a little bit about hope to get us started this morning. Uh, and I'm sorry to say this, but I have to talk about the World Series. I know I gave you a break last week for, for you fans who are disappointed, but we got to talk about it. Because I bumped into a friend of mine uh, this week, and we were talking, you know, just like, hey, how you doing? He says, man, I'm exhausted. Now, my friend is a huge baseball fan. Like, he would have been a professional baseball player if he hadn't had the injury. You all know that, those guys, right? Uh, and, and he's really good and loves baseball, passionate. He's like, I'm just exhausted. And I'm like, oh, a lot of, lot of late night games, right? And he was like, yeah, I mean, that's, that's part of it, but that's not the whole thing. And I was like, well, it's, you know, it's hard to lose, right? It's hard to be disappointed uh, with an outcome. And he's like, yeah, that's part of it too. He's like, I just, I didn't know this was what it was like to be in the World Series. I just had so much excitement. I just had so much hope. Day and night, it's all I was thinking about. And I just, I had so much hope. And now, now I'm just really, really tired. And I thought to myself, I know this wasn't quite what he was saying, but I, I asked myself, Are you, did you just tell me that you think hope is exhausting? Uh, I thought that was an interesting reaction. And it reminded me, my conversation with him, about the difference between kind of the worldly definition of hope when we use it in kind of a worldly sense and the definition of hope, when we talk about it in the biblical sense, or when we talk about it in the sense of our hope in Christ. Because hope in the worldly sense, whether it's hope for a new job, or hope that your team wins, or whatever it is, is a hope uh, with an outcome that you are not sure about. You hope it happens, you desire for that outcome to come true, but you do not know if it will or not. But when we talk about the kind of hope we read about in the Bible, we talk about our hope in Christ, that's not what hope means. Hope is the assurance of something to come. It is knowing the outcome, and because we know the outcome, we are encouraged and energized by what is to come. Worldly hope it's a hope for an outcome. We don't know if it's going to happen or not. But the hope in Christ is knowing what will happen and being energized, it getting us through our day, it helped driving us forward in life because we know what is to come. And so this morning, we want to talk about the hope of the resurrection in Jesus and how that hope drives, directs, and points our life Forward. That our hope is not like hoping something happens, like our favorite sports team, but an assurance of the future that encourages us forward. We're going to see that in Mark chapter 15, so you could open up there. Our last message in the book of Mark, after a long journey through the book of Mark. And here's how we're going to approach it. We're going to read through the text. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the resurrection. And then we have to kind of deal with the ending of Mark here, uh, which at a first glance... Uh, may uh, surprise us uh, and may, may seem very strange or unusual when we read it, uh, we'll get there. And it, that will all tie together to, with our hope in Jesus. <clears throat> okay, Let's, uh, we're going to be starting to read in chapter 15 uh, in verse 40. Let me catch you up before I start reading there where we left off uh, last week. Jesus has been uh, arrested, tried, and he has been killed on the cross. And last week we talked about uh, at his death on the cross that the veil was torn, that through his death uh, we have forgiveness for our sins for all who believe. That through his, his death in our place, he paid for our sins and gives us direct, a direct line to God, direct access to Almighty God. But we pick up the story here at Jesus' death at this very dark moment in verse 40. And there were also women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, the younger, and of Joses and of Salome. And when he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him. But there were also other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. It's kind of a lot of information about these women kind of pointed right after Jesus' death. And you might end up, well, why is this, what is this doing here in the text? 
And there's kind of two reasons. One, uh, like many of Mark's stories, he likes to kind of sandwich things together, kind of opens an idea, there's, there's something in the middle, and then he closes with an idea, kind of creates a sandwich out of it. And that's actually how this last uh, section in Mark is going to work for us today. But there's a second reason. Because the, the last thing we knew, all the disciples had fled. Judas had betrayed Jesus. Ten of the other disciples fled Jesus, it told us in chapter uh, 14, when he was arrested. Uh, and Peter himself kind of stuck around a little longer when Jesus was on trial, but eventually himself. The last thing we heard of Peter is that he had denied Jesus three times. And so, while other Gospels kind of give us little hints of what, where some of these disciples are, uh, Mark doesn't say anything about where the disciples are, but he lets us know these women are here because they're going to be the, one, the first ones to see something amazing. Let me keep reading. Verse 42. And when evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage, and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. And Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have already died. And summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead. And we learned that from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. And Joseph brought a linen shroud, and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of of the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb." And Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, was where he was laid. Now, Joseph of Arimathea is an interesting character. It says he was a member of the council. The council? It wasn't just the council that had, had made all these accusations against Jesus and had, had tried him and put him up on this cross by going to Pilate, the same council? Uh, and, it, and it's true, but it says that, that Joseph was seeking the kingdom of God. Not a lot of people on the council seeking the kingdom of God. And some people would think of Joseph as a secret disciple, someone who was kind of wanted to follow Jesus, but maybe was on the fence or, or couldn't really say it because of his position of power or whatever the reason. But he does uh, find the resting place for Jesus, which answers a prophecy from Isaiah that Jesus would be buried in a rich man's, that Messiah would be buried in a rich man's tomb. And they roll this big stone against the entrance of the tomb because they would seal a tomb. Other Gospels would tell us uh, that they they extra sealed this tomb, put guards outside so no one could mess with the body of Jesus. But the woman saw where he was laid. And they would still want to perform kind of the funeral rites for Christ. And so in verse 16, that's what happened. It says, When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. Important fact here is that they waited for the Sabbath. Uh, Friday night, Jesus, or fri- on Friday, Jesus died. On Saturday was the Sabbath. You're not supposed to go near or touch a dead body on the Sabbath. That's something you're not supposed to do, along with all the other work that you're not supposed to be doing on the Sabbath. So they had to wait until Sunday to go and see Jesus and anoint him and and I'm, to be completely honest, a lot of that is just for, for smell and other reasons. Uh, death was much more uh, close to people's lives in those days. And so they had to wait a day before they could go and see him. And we remember that Jesus said he would be raised on not the first day when he died, not the second day, but on the third day. So if he was on the cross on Friday, that would be Sunday when he would be raised. Verse 2. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? Because remember, there's this giant, huge stone that that Joseph on his own probably wouldn't have been able to move. He probably had a bunch of helpers to move this giant stone to kind of seal the entrance to uh, the tomb place here. Uh, And these, these women wouldn't have been able to move it. It would have been just... These things were giant. I actually saw what one of these tombs looked like when I was in Israel. And these things are cut, like, right out of the rock. These stones are are giant boulders. And, yes, they roll. But, man, to get one of these things going was not easily, especially since it had been sealed by Pilate and the Roman authorities. In verse 4, And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. 
And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe. And they were alarmed. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. I, this should sound familiar. What do angels always say to people when they see him? Do not be afraid. And what happens when people see the angels? Ah! <laughs> right? Every time. That's what's happening here. Where's Jesus? Who's this man in white? And we, we believe this is an angel that has come to deliver a message to these women. Because the word angel means messenger. Literally, both in the Old Testament in Hebrew and in Greek in the New Testament, the word angel literally means messenger. These are the messengers of God. And among the various things they do, their primary function is proclaiming God's message. And God had sent him with a message for this woman because Jesus' body, who they saw die on the cross, who they saw taken down from the cross, who they saw brought into this tomb dead, wrapped in linen, was gone. He is risen. I'll give you another try on that one. I told you it was going to come back around, right? He is risen. <laughs> and he says to them, you seek Jesus of Nazareth who is crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb. This is the women. For trembling and astonishment had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. And afraid uh, as in, could this be true? Could it really happen? Was anyone going to believe them if they told them? And so they're, they're running with astonishment, and I could only imagine emotionally what was going on in their minds. Could this be true? Could Jesus really be raised from the dead? And they go to tell the disciples, and... And actually, that's the end of the book of Mark. Likely in your, your copy of whatever translation you're in, you have a little note there, and then there's some more text in brackets. Uh, in the ESV, it says, some of the earliest manuscripts do not include chapter 16, 9 through 20, um, meaning that some of the earliest manuscripts of, of, of Mark that we have uh, don't have these verses here that maybe some scribe said, well, we can't leave this ending here, and they looked at Matthew, and they looked at Mark, and they looked at, or not Mark, this is Mark, Matthew and Luke and John, and said, okay, we could kind of fill in some of the details here, so if someone only has this copy of Mark, they could know kind of how the story ends. I know some of you would be saying, like, wait, what? Is this, this happen all the time? Like, what, what do you mean it's not in the earliest manual? What's this all about? I want to stick to what the text is all about today. We are going to talk about that next week. We're going to talk about the reliability of Scripture next week, why we could trust it in the process, kind of talk about how the Bible came together and what's going on here at the end of Mark that we have this marking that I believe this is that there's no more to Mark. It stops at verse 8 uh, for a really important reason that we'll get to by the end of today. But we're going to talk about that next week and kind of have an understanding of how the Bible came together and how actually this little note at the, mar at the end of Mark gives us more assurance that we can rely on Scripture, that we have the words that were written down empowered by the Holy Spirit. We'll talk about that next week. But I, I want to talk about the resurrection this week, right? I, I, we need to talk about this resurrection a little bit more right now. So let, let's start there, and then we're going to talk about this ending and what that means for how we understand the book of Mark and the resurrection itself. So this is what we want to talk about first with the resurrection. That living in the power of Christ's resurrection gives us hope today and forever. That living in the power of Christ's resurrection gives us hope for today and forever. The resurrection, I think, personally, is the greatest miracle in all of Scripture. And that's saying something because God has done a lot of amazing things in the scriptures. God uh, uh, parted the Red Sea for Moses and the Israelites. He sent fire from heavens other times. He gave his troops impossible victories in battles. He sent the walls of Jericho tumbling down, right? He, uh, he through, through Jesus and himself and the miracles he performed, he calmed the sea in the storms. He healed people who could not be healed by anyone else. And he cast out demons. 
on all these cases and all these miracles, and they are amazing and demonstrate God's awesome power. They're a demonstration of God's rule and his ability to manipulate and change his creation and the rules of physics that he has set up, or in the case of the casting out in demons and those kind of miracles that God did, his authority and power over all the spiritual world. But I think the resurrection deserves its own category. And part of that is because it took a day, more than a day, for the resurrection to occur. Stone was sealed on the Sabbath. He was not raised until the third day, as he said. I don't mean to be morbid here, but I think we need to just wrestle with the realities of death here and what it meant for God to raise Christ from the dead. That when a body dies, the cells begin to break down. It, the body begins to decompose, and it happens uh, troublingly quickly to us. That God couldn't just get that heart start beating again. All the brain cells were dead. There'd be nothing left working there. Well, if God started the heart and fixed the brain cells, well, then there'd be other parts, like nothing would be able to work anymore. It's more than just calming the seas and casting out demons. The resurrection is recreation. It's recreation. And when I think about the resurrection, here in every place it's talked about, it is the greatest work that God has done since he created in the first place, since he spoke creation into being. And Genesis chapter 1, and created and designed all things. The resurrection is a recreation. Jesus doesn't just come back as he was before, and, and this is where other gospels are helpful. He's different somehow. Something's changed. We call this his glorified body. Something's different about Jesus. In fact, in, in one account, uh, they don't, the disciples don't even immediately recognize who he is. They just didn't expect to see him. He's, he's different and changed in some way. The scripture talks about our future res resurrection in the same way. That we will be given glorified bodies that will not desire sin. That will not give in to temptation. Something has changed. The resurrection is about recreation. And understanding this is important because it says something very key about the character of God. That God doesn't just leave things broken but he fixes them. He repairs. He makes new. And in fact, if we think about part of our hope the, hope, the hope of the resurrection that is for forever, is that all who believe in Jesus will one day be resurrected, will one day be made new. And not only will we be made new, but all of creation will be remade new. All of creation will be fixed so that there is no more difficulty and pain and sin anymore. That is the hope of resurrection, recreation, that God desires to take things that are broken, that are, that are not working, and to make them new. I read this all the time, but I'm going to read it again anyway. Revelation chapter 21 that talks about this new heavens and the new earth, our eternal destiny. It says in verse 1 of chapter 21, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And then it said in verse 3, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. This is what the hope of the resurrection for us is. An eternity where one day God is going to fix all things. He doesn't leave them broken. He recreates them. So they're not something completely new, right? We will still be us in eternity in some respect, but in other respects, we will be made new. It's exciting. But it's not just eternity we're looking forward to. The hope of the resurrection and the power of the res resurrection is also for today. 
And in fact, Ephesians make this, makes this point abundantly clear that the hope of the power of the resurrection is also for today. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 16 through 20 say this. I've got to read some of the context so we get into it. I'll tell you when we're really hitting the, the section I want us to read. Uh, Paul's writing to them. He says, I do not cease to give thanks to, for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. And now this is where we're really focusing, verse 19. And this is what he's praying for, and that they would know this and understand this. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Here is Paul saying, he's saying, you know the power that raised Christ from the dead? You know the power that made something that was dead and recreated him and made him alive again today? You know the same power that one day will recreate all creation and make all things new and rid the earth of, of death and sorrow and pain? That power is already beginning to be at work in you today. That same power. And so the resurrection, resurrection gives us hope today that slowly God is working in us to make us new. That his power is active in us, changing us and molding us and shaping us into the image of his son. That we are slowly but surely being built into something new from the in side out by the same power it says here that raised Christ from the dead. And so the hope of the resurrection is not just eternity. It's today. God's working in you. God's working in me. It's like it's like owning a house, I think, sometimes. So we, we moved in our house and it wasn't very old. It was a young house but uh, still some work to do. We, we, we added something new to our house. Uh, we uh, finished, uh, thanks to the help of actually many of you, finished a room above my garage and turned into an office. That's something that wasn't there before. It was just an empty space, useless, cold in the winter, too hot in the summer, and now where I get to do some of my study and where I read the Bible with my kids and some of those things. It's something new. But there's other parts of the house that over time just need to kind of be recreated a new floor. It's still the same house, but eventually, I already know one place, there needs to be a rug that needs to be replaced at some point here. There's going to be a shower head that needs to be replaced. Maybe, maybe we didn't like the way this was set up. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna put a cabinet here when there was something else there before. And slowly, a house is transformed over the time that you own it until, except for you know, the bones, many of the pieces of it don't look the same as when you first bought it. Talk to some people who've been in a house 30, 40 years, and they've been through two or three iterations of the inside of their house as they've improved it. And that's, that's kind of like the work that the recreation that God is doing in us today. It's not going to be complete in our lifetime. That's why we look forward to eternity. But sh- slowly and surely, he's, either, he's adding something in our lives that wasn't there before. Or he's repairing something that's broken and making it new. Or is he, he's replacing this thing, or this thing that was good at one time, well... It's time for God to generate something new in you. And so he kind of changes it again and molds and shapes us. And we are growing in our grace. We are growing in our faith. We're growing in our attitudes. We're growing in our beliefs. We're growing in the way we treat one another. We're growing with the way we see the world. And we're growing in the way we see God. We're growing in the way we see ourselves. And we're growing. Slowly, surely, being recreated by the same power that raised Christ from the dead. Living in the power of Christ's resurrection gives us hope today and forever. There's still another point in this passage that I haven't gotten to yet. 
think we still have to ask the deal. If, if, if Shane's right, and not Shane, not Shane, like many scholars, like the people who translated the ESV or whatever version you're reading, if these scholars are right and Mark really ends at chapter 8, what's the deal with that ending? Like, how come the story stops right there? It seems very abrupt, doesn't it? Jesus rises from the dead, the women go and tell the disciples, and the end. That's the credits. That's, what's with that? I think there's something special here. Listen, when we read the scriptures, we don't just read them to extract information. The scriptures are written by different people with different perspective that the Holy Spirit empowered to do this work. So the exact words that God wanted on page were on the page, but that's why we have four Gospels with four different purposes. For example, you look, read the book of Mark, it ha- or sorry, Matthew, it has a very different purpose than Mark. Matthew's written to a Jewish audience. Matthew's the deep gospel. There's so many Old Testament allusions. It's written to a Jewish audience that would have known the Old Testament scriptures, and it's rich, and it's deep. And it's very different than Mark, which is very quick and succinct. It's different from the book of John, which is the feeler edition of the gospel. John just, he's just, Oh, he's got a lot of emotion. He's almost poetic in his language. It's not technically you know, poetry in the, in the biblical sense, but it's just his love. And he says he has a purpose for writing his gospel. His purpose is so that whoever reads it might believe. That's his purpose. Luke has an entirely different purpose. Dr. Luke, and in his gospel, writes his gospel uh, basically to create an accurate account. I'm going to go. I'm going to talk to all the people. I'm going to interview them. Actually, it, he's less of a doctor. He's more of like a reporter, I feel like being a reporter myself. I'm going to go interview all the people. I'm going to put it down on paper, and you decide to the person he's writing who this Jesus really was, what this is really all about, based on my careful work. But what was Mark all about? Mark was really about, was told from the perspective of Peter. And so I want to remind you of just kind of the flow of the book of Mark, and I think that's going to reveal to us why this ending is the way it is and the important question it ends up asking us. The first section of the book of Mark was all about the disciples and Peter discerning Jesus' person. Who is Jesus? That's what the first section was all about, the discernment of the personhood of Jesus. Who is he? And and the disciples are wrestling with this as they see Jesus perform these miracles and do these amazing things and change people's lives. And it's like that until about chapter 8 where it makes a turn. And, and, and the narrative of Mark turns very clearly when Peter realizes something. Jesus is having a conversation with the disciples in chapter 8. And in verse 29, after they're talking about, what do all these people say I am? Who do they say I am? He's talking to the disciples. In verse 29, he says, and he asked them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, you are the Christ the Messiah. That's what the Christ means. It's the Messiah. You are the Savior. And the book turns from being discernment of Jesus' person to now learning about accepting Jesus' mission. And that whole section is about accepting Jesus' mission. Because the disciples are like, oh, this is the Messiah? Great. He's going to overthrow Rome. We're going to have this great political revolution. We're going to set up camp back in Jerusalem again, and and we're going to have control of ourselves, and it's going to be like the days of David or something like that. But that's not really Jesus' mission. As they go through this section of accepting Jesus' mission, it kind of goes through this cycle. Jesus shares he's going to die and be raised on the third day. And then says, no, this kingdom isn't the way you think it might be. And through different iterations of that, it's essentially said, if, if you want to be first, you have to choose to be last. If you want to be first, you have to choose to be last. Because the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. That the mission of Jesus is to save humankind and that the mission for those who follow him is not try to seize power in a worldly sense, but to submit themselves to God's power and to serve those around him, to be the image of Jesus because that's what Jesus did. And so they're challenged with accepting Jesus' mission. That's the second part. And then we get into the third phase of the gospel, which is really about faithfulness 
to Jesus. It was about faithfulness to Jesus. Because when he enters Jerusalem, he says he was going to be killed. He was going to be mocked and spit on, and that times are going to be difficult. And this season is an acknowledgement and a test for the disciples to see that following Jesus is sometimes going to be difficult. And he says, Jesus says to them, on the night he was betrayed, as they're walking to the Garden of Gethsemane, he says, listen, you are all going to fall away from me. And the disciples are like, what? No, we are not going to do that, Jesus. We, we love you. And Peter, of course, is, is extra emphatic in that because that's kind of who Peter was. And Peter in verse 29 says, Even though they all fall away, I will not. And Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said emphatically, If I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same. But after Jesus is arrested, it says in chapter 14, verse 50, And they all left him and fled. The disciples scattered. Peter does come back a little bit, though. He kind of, kind of sneaks back in. And when Jesus is in the chief priest's house being tried in this sham of a trial that we talked about a couple weeks ago, Jesus' prediction comes true. This uh, servant girl comes to and says, Hey, aren't you, with, aren't you with that Jesus guy? And Peter's like, No, 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 no. Never knew the man, never, and denies Jesus three times. Just as Jesus had warned him, he would. And the last thing we hear from Peter is this. And he broke down and wept. That's it. That is the last we hear of Peter. And the crucifixion happens. We don't hear of where Peter is or what happened to him until. Until. The women go into the tomb with the stone rolled away. And what is the message that God wanted his messenger, the angel, to give to these women, to spread to all who would hear? He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter... Go ahead, tell his disciples and Peter he will see them in Galilee just as he said he would. Go tell Peter, Peter who had messed up, Peter who had denied Jesus three times even though he promised he wouldn't. Peter who you would think be cast out and, and, and that would be the end of him being a disciple. No, go tell the disciples and Peter to meet him in Galilee. And then it ends. And the message is one That Peter's time is not up. Despite his denial of Jesus, because Jesus died on the cross for his sins and was resurrected from the dead, Peter has forgiveness in the face of his terrible error and can still follow Jesus. But it really is asking the question of us, by emptying, ending so abruptly. And ask us the question, when we follow Jesus, when we follow Jesus, we're going to go and metaphorically meet him in Galilee and see what he does. Or are we going to go on this spiritual journey together and see where God leads us? And if Mark is any indication. If we follow Jesus, we will see amazing things. We will see Jesus do things that we could not have possibly asked for, and that would amaze us. And we're going to start learning that, boy, Jesus' mission is different than the kind of mission we would go on if we were, if we were going on a kind of a worldwide uh, uh, a movement here that's about serving and, 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 and submitting ourselves to the will of God and loving others and loving your enemies and and serving those who might even mistreat, like all those things and accepting that mission. And, and you know what? Sometimes it's going to be a challenge to follow Jesus in this world just as disciples experienced it. But that we are invited back, even in our failures, to continue to follow him. 
to continue being part of his transformational work around the world. The power that was at work in his resurrection, working in those who believe in him. And so my question for you then is the same question I think the book leaves us with implicitly, if not explicitly. Are you going to follow Jesus? I know many here at Pine Grove are very faithful people. We've already said yes and yes and yes again. And so I think we need to get a little more specific for this week. So we close the book of Matthew or Mark and leave it behind us for now. All we have learned about Jesus, all of what we have learned about being his follower, what, it, what does it look like to follow Jesus this week? What is he doing in your heart, in your inner being? How is he transforming you this week? How is he showing you to love more or forgive others or yourself? Where is he leading you this week? And if you're not a follower of Jesus, I would like to make that invitation to you to come and follow the Savior, to come follow Jesus because he died on the cross for our sins and was resurrected from the dead, that all who believe in him would not perish but have eternal light and the power of the resurrection working in your life, in my life today for those who believe. And that's really all God asks of us, to believe, to trust, to have faith that Jesus did this for us. And all the promises we read about here and this hope of the resurrection is ours. If you have more questions about that, I would love to talk to you about it. I get real excited about it. Pastor Jaden would love to talk to you about it. Bob Martin, who prayed for us this morning, or any of our elders would pray about it. Our people of Pine Grove would love to talk to you and pray about that with you and talk about that more with you. But for all of us, my prayer is that we continue on this journey of following Jesus, seeing where he might lead us, seeing him work around us and in, our, in our minds, in our hearts, and our lives, to continue this, this journey that began, you know, 2,000 years ago with Peter and the disciples being called with the resurrection of Jesus, following him as God works in our broken and hurting world today. And he invites us to take part in that work. And that, I think, is pretty amazing. Let's pray. Lord, I pray for each of us today that you would show us what to do with this book of Mark, this, this story, this, this history of, of what you have already done, what you are doing, and this promise of what you will do. Lord, I pray you might show each of us this week what, it, what it's going to mean for us this week to follow Jesus, to operate not in our power, but the power of the resurrection, to hope, to trust, to grow in our faith and be used by you to do the work that you are doing here and around the world. Show us, Lord, what it means to follow you this week or follow your son this week. We pray this by the power of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen.